to send everyone in our church that has a birthday a card. So let's give her a hand. <laughs> Never forget. So God bless you. It's so good to be here. Yeah, Pastor Dave is going up north to take his family for a Bible, uh, for a daily vacation Bible school. And he privileged me to be able to speak tonight. And uh, I preached this morning upon Christ's love for the church. And Revelation chapter 1, I believe that this church down through the years has been the closest to, uh, to one of the seven churches is the church at Ephesus because there's been a lot of wonderful things and commendations down through the years. But God, uh, we, we all need to just uh, be encouraged because I think over a period of time, we just disconnect a little bit. All right, and Jesus said, and we're going to look at this uh, to start with in Revelation uh, chapter chapter 2. We're going to look at this for a few moments. And uh, as soon as I get my specs on. It'll be good to one day have a brand new eyes that we won't need glasses. Amen. Won't need false teeth. Amen. Last week I had a tooth broke, and so I got a crown coming Thursday. That's my dentist's favorite song in the church. Crown him with many crowns. Because they are whopping expensive, amen, so I won't get distracted on that. Tonight, I uh, began to think today about how Jesus had said, uh, and the, the only thing that he told the church at Ephesus, he said, uh, uh, I have somewhat against thee because uh, thou hast left thy first love. And uh, tonight, I'm going to be preaching on reconnecting our first love. Reconnecting our first love. And there's some interesting things here. So let's read the scripture. And Under the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Here's his commendations. I know thy works, and thy labors, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hath labored, and hath not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, for else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But, thou, uh, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deed of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And to him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Join my, uh, our hearts together in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I love you and I thank you for the privilege to speak tonight. I thank you for what you put upon my heart for the Bible class this morning about your love for the church, and your explanations are magnificent in the Scripture so that we can have in perfect detail, dear Father, what your great mission to the earth is, the saving of souls. Oh, how we thank you for salvation's plan 
We thank you for who you are and what you do and for your love. And I ask now that you uh, look upon these sacred pages that's written for our admonition and for our learning and uh, hide me behind the cross of Christ uh, as I begin to uh, speak for you. I do not desire to speak anything from me, but only from you. So I pray, Father, now you'd use your word to speak to our hearts about this important thing of reconnecting to our first love. And we know when anything goes out of kilter between us and you, that we are the ones that need to repent. God only repents and changes his mind when sinners that are under the sentence of death and hell and judgment change their mind and come to you and you repent of what you would have done unto those, Lord. Oh, God, we thank you. We thank you so much for heaven. We thank you for your sacrifice at the cross and now for the precious scriptures. I pray you're blessed in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. And God bless you. Reconnecting with our first love. Some of you will maybe remember back in your childhood when you were growing up. Uh, I've told my wife this story that I had a little sweetheart when I was about five or six years old. I remember her name was Sandra Adkins. It's something because I had a crush. All right? Now some say, well, you know, that's not real love. That's puppy love. But I'm here to tell you, it's real to the puppy. <laughs> Amen? We all go through these things. We all go through these things. But I'll never forget, as I was ministering at 18 years old with my family at the Brewer Baptist Church, when I walked in the door, and saw the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. And she's sitting in here tonight to hear me preach. We'll be celebrating 64 years of marriage, June the 11th, which is next Tuesday. And so it's wonderful. And she's been the love of my life. But if you can remember your first love, you know... I think that's, I, I, I thought of that to say this. There's so many marriages fall apart. But when they first meet and they fall in love, either one would do anything for the other. They would put up anything if you're really in love with somebody. Love doesn't just go away. It, it doesn't have a, a, a faucet that you can turn it on and turn it off. Love grows. And love grows, I can tell you that it grows. 64 years later, love grows. And that's why love hurts. You can, to, to lose somebody, it's devastating. But I wondered, all of those marriage counselors out there that have the people coming forward to save marriages, if those couples could just go back to the time when they really loved each other and go back and reconnect. What happens? They disconnect from their first love. Now, it's no, it's no, no strange thing to me that Jesus said to the church, after all of these wonderful things he said to the church, he said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, and that's because he's given us instruction not not to, he's not giving us destruction. He's given us instruction to repent and to turn and to do our first works. Because wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody could feel like you were just saved? Do you remember? And can you even comprehend when Jesus Christ took the burden of your sin and let it all float away. When I was saved, I didn't think my feet hit the ground for two weeks. 
it finally came down. It will. But we can't ever forget the, the day of our salvation. And I just, a week or so ago, a few weeks ago, talked to a man that I won to the Lord 30 years ago. And at my voice on the phone, he broke down, and the first thing he said, I will never forget the one that led me to Jesus, which was you. You do not know the impact that you have. And people make up the church. That's what we've done. Jesus talked to those in Ephesus there about submitting yourself and knowing the will of God and coming together and doing our individual parts collectively together to make a church because a, a church is not just a building, it's the people of, of that building. And, uh, and the building is just a place for the people to meet together collectively uh, to do the work and the bidding of God. But God gave himself for the church. Now the church is every saved, born again person out there that's going to heaven with Jesus. That's the church. The church is not bricks and mortar and stones and carpets. The church is people, the human beings. You, I am preaching tonight to the church. And, and God gave some great commendations to the church, to the angel. And he tells us who the angels are. The seven stars were the seven angels, which are the messengers or the pastors to the church. And then the seven golden candlesticks is the churches. And he gave us a... Uh, uh, seven different church scenarios in the Word of God. And if you're going to try to fi figure out what kind of a church you have, you need to look and, and, and select one. I believe the church at Ephesus is closer to, to our local assembly today with what we believe and what we propagate than any of the others. The, some of these churches had drastic problems in them. But God gives his commendations. You write these things that holds in his right hand the stars or the angels or the messengers to the church. Because this is not my church. It's not Pastor Day's church. It's God's church. And God wants us to do it all, to have it all. He really does. And his hand is holding it. I know thy works. Man, church is supposed to have works. Works of Jesus Christ to reach a lost and dying world, the people of the world, to Jesus Christ. And your labors, and it takes labors on the building and labors out there to draw finances so God's church can be supported. And your patience of waiting and, and how you bear uh, patience, and thank God, uh, you learn patience from Jesus. Thank God for his forbearance. And how that you cannot bear them which are evil. And we look at that. People look at Christians who cannot bear the evil as wicked haters. But they don't realize that we're not wicked haters. We are fervent lovers. I do not, do not preach in hatred. I preach in love. But somebody that's so far from love in the evil is going to be floundering and boisterous and critical and destructive, not knowing that someone like a preacher like me loved their soul. I have wept over the lost. I have carried a broken heart for those that did not even care about their own soul. And don't tell me it's hatred. It's a love that Jesus Christ put there. Because when he went to the cross, 
He didn't go for his friends. He went for his enemies, for those that despised him, for those that rejected him. I know thy labors, your patience, and how you hate the evil. I have to hate the evil because God hates the sin. He never hates the sinner. He hates the sin. My Bible tells me to hate the things that God hates and love the things that God hates. But God's supremacy is always put on every single human soul. And we're not to be condemning because you know what? We don't need to condemn. And we don't condemn because we're condemned already. We're born condemned under the sentence of death and hell. And the unsaved people that we witness to just realize how that we're trying to reach them for their safety, for their security, for their soul to be in heaven rather than hell. The real friend and the one that really loves you is going to tell you the truth. You don't ever want to go to a doctor that when you have cancer, knowing that he'll tell you, well, you're going to be all right. Nothing to worry about. Take some of these pills and go home. Doctor's going to tell you the truth. If he doesn't, he's a quack. And the false prophets have preached the wrong stuff. They're quacks too. Off base. In the flesh. God's got his word crystal clear. Without any controversy or contradiction. And he goes on to say, even those that claim to be apostles are not, which are the false prophets, you found them to be liars and you've tried them, you've borne them, you've proved them. Yeah, we watch who's in our pulpits. We believe the cardinal doctrines of the word of God. We do not believe in mama called preachers. Only God sent. And some just do it because they want a living. Well, I tell you what, I've never heard very many preachers that ever retired or died rich. Except the ones that take money under false pretenses, which should be in the penitentiary. Amen? God is the one that pays. And it pays to serve God. And he said, you've borne many things and you've had patience for my name's sake and you've, you've labored and you've not fainted. You stayed in there when the going was tough. The tough got going. That was a Ford Motor Company slogan. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. And so that's where we need to be sometimes. We need to understand that we need to press on regardless of, of anything that happens. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. And this is the only one thing. You've left your first love. So connect back to your first love. I want to encourage us tonight to reconnect some things. All right? Reconnect some things. In the scripture that I used in Zechariah this morning about the golden candlestick and the, uh, uh, Zerubbabel, there how God gave him a great victory. He starts in his vision in chapter 4 about the angel of the Lord coming and showing him the seven golden candlesticks and, and, the, and, the, and the seven lamps and the two olive trees. That is parallel right straight back over to the seven golden candlesticks and the seven stars which are the angel of the Lord and the right hand of, of, of God. 
and the church is a, the golden candlestick and building the church. And back then, uh, in Zerubbabel's uh, confrontation in verse 6 that I brought up this morning, he said, what are these golden candlesticks? What, what's that mean about the church? And he was going through that struggle. And he said, because this is from the words of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Then God said, the mountains are going to be leveled. That mountain that you feared in your life is going to turn to a plain. He said that you have started the works of the foundation and laid the foundation of the house of God with your hands, and you're going to know that the Lord of hosts, the eyes of God, are looking down. Why? Because the church is God's. The ministry is God's. We're servants together to do the work of God. And think of that great privilege, how, how many times have I told you, it's not amazing to me that God saves people and Jesus died on the cross and all these wonderful things. That's who God is. You know what blows my mind? That God chose somebody like me and you to do his whole work. His whole work. What is his whole work, preacher? His whole work is to save the world and save lost souls. He did not come to call the righteous to repentance. He came to call sinners to repentance. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And in that chapter 4 of Zechariah, I want us to go right back to that spot and go back one chapter to chapter 3, and I want you to, I want to bring this to you. Reconnecting with Jesus Christ. Here is where the great war in heaven is going on between Satan and, and the devil that was kicked out of heaven. In chapter 3. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now when it says the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it's none other than Jesus Christ. And Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua, and remember in the Old Testament, Joshua the high priest was the one that would go one time a year in and bring the people into the presence of God. Back then, God was saying, stay away. Priest, you can bring the people because Christ hadn't come yet. But when Christ came and died upon the cross and finished salvation's plan, remember that when Jesus was raised from the dead, the graves burst open. And he descended down into the heart of the earth and preached unto the spirits in the prison, in the, in the upper chamber uh, 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 of Sheol in paradise, where that thief that died upon the cross with him went. He said, Master, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And that day Jesus died. That thief died. And he went down and he down into paradise. He was probably surprised to see Jesus right there in paradise with him. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You know, that's a wonderful thing because in the course of life, any time we decide we don't want to go to hell and we want to go to heaven and we kneel down and we receive Christ as our personal Savior right now, 
today. You're as good as heaven today. Today. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. When you meet Jesus. Now Joshua, the high priest, was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel of the Lord. Now why? Because Joshua, the high priest, was human. He was standing before the angel of the Lord. He was in filthy garments, but he was allowed to be there because he was bringing the people to God before him. And don't you know there's going to be a great cleansing? Joshua, the, the high priest, is going, to be, is going to be changed. He's going to be cleansed. And he's going to be saved. And guess who's there to resist? The devil. At his right hand. To hold him back. What's the devil doing today? The same thing. Trying to keep sinners' minds blinded. Trying to keep Christians' mouths shut from witnessing. Trying to do everything he can to hurt the work of God. And sometimes Christians let him get by with it. We ought to buck the old boy. We can't disconnect from our first love. Because I want to tell you what the first love of God is. I've said this till I'm blue in the face, and I'll keep on till I'm blue in the face. But the most important thing to God in all the world is to save every soul that will come to him. For God so loved the world, that's the souls of the world, that he gave his only begotten son. For who? For whosoever will. That's not the friends of God. That's the enemies of God. That's the lost sinner. The one that's separated from God. Whosoever. You can walk up to anybody, anytime, anywhere, and say, look, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those words they need to hear. Because salvation comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we have to have compassionate, caring hearts to approach people with that message because they cannot be saved without human instrumentality or somebody preaching or praying or witnessing or giving out the gospel. That's our great responsibility that God has put us as the watchman of those sinners who don't even care about their own souls and we're supposed to care, and we're supposed to witness, and we're supposed to pray without compassionate hearts. There's no way that we're going to do the job to get those souls soul saved. You can and you will make a difference. And so Joshua was standing there. A cleansing is going to take. And he, he answered and spake unto those that stood before him. The angel of the Lord, take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And he said, Let them set a fair mitre. That's a crown upon his head. So they've set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. I want to go on a little farther. The angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, 
then thou shalt also judge my house. Thou shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. In other words, the cleansing's already happened. And then God said in verse 8, Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch, B-R-A-N-C-H. You didn't know he was only, not only a child of God and a beloved and a saint. You're a branch. The branch is what brings forth the fruit. Those two witnesses in chapter 4 of the uh, there of the two olive trees olive representing the oil the the anointed ones that stood by God on the left and on the right of the golden candlesticks which is the church you're a branch you're a messenger of God you're an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. An ambassador is one that don't bring their own message. An ambassador takes the message from the president of the company where the authority is and goes abroad and delivers the message of the president. We're, we are to take the gospel into a lost and dying world and deliver the message of God. We are ambassadors for God and for Jesus Christ. Yeah, you are too. You didn't know you were an ambassador and a saint and a branch and a child. Amen? But we know that. We've got many names in the, the, and, and the world don't call us any of those things. We'd be surprised what they call us. But God calls us blessed. He said, For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the engravings thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. I pray that God would remove the iniquity of our land. In one day. I've got news for you. Trump's not going to do it. He may do a lot of good things, but he's not going to do that. Only God. This nation is under the careful, watching eyes of God. And God knows everything from front before to after. So if God gives you some surprises during the election, don't criticize it. God also is a God of wrath and a God of judgment. And God knows to stop what he wants to stop and do what he wants to do. In verse 10, In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor, under the vine and under the fig tree. Now, I'm going to, those that are this way, you're going to be able to go right up into the tree of life, into the celestial city of God, and feast forever. What a blessing, what a hope. One more scripture, and I'm finished. But just before the book of Revelation, where all of this happened, there's a little book of one chapter here called the book of Jude. And this is my favorite portion of scripture about compassionate hearts. If we want to reconnect the first love we had, if you can just remember back how, where you were and where God brought you from when he saved our wretched soul and how thrilled you were and still are thrilled at what he did. But it's easy to get your eyes on all this stuff 
and disconnect. God help us. Baptist churches have disconnected. They've left the whole paths of ministry, many of them. There's good and bad and all. Get back to your first love. Why? Because it's God's church. He wants it filled. How many of you know? Go out into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. House of God filled. Why? So the word of God can be preached because that's what happened to America when preachers stopped preaching in the pulpit. The revival days ended. We need to reconnect to our first love. Soul winning was the most important thing to God. That's why he gave his only begotten son. Why? For everybody in the world so they could be saved. It was the most important thing to Jesus because it was his blood that was shed to cover the sin of the world. And it was willingness to obey the words of his father. He wouldn't do anything against the words of God. He stayed faithful, bearing the cross, bearing the shame, completing his mission, raising from the dead training his disciples, giving us the road map to preach by, as well as a great commission to do the very work of God. Yes, we're sinners saved in the hand of God, only instruments of love and compassion and caring that we can do the work of God, which is reaching the lost. Oh, what a selfish world we're living in, even in the Christian world. I just want to challenge us to reconnect with our first love. Reconnect with compassionate hearts because Jesus gave his heart, his mind, his body, and his soul, and he gave it all. So should we. All of the resources we have ought to be headed towards soul winning and keeping people out of hell. Money and time, everything we can do to reach down and save a wretched soul. We should be looking forward to witnessing to everyone God will put in our path. Do you think you would ask God just to give you a fresh and a brand new reconnection. You see, when the power goes out, you got to go switch, flip the switch. Because it's not by might and it's not by spirit and not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So we need to be synchronized afresh and anew with the filling of the Holy Spirit of God with compassionate hearts to give and go and do whatever it takes to do the work of God. Because this church belongs to God. I do not ask you to labor for me. I ask you to labor for God. I do not ask you to sacrifice for me. I ask you to sacrifice for God. I ask you to do what God asks you to do. In that way, our church will be blessed. We used to sing a song. I'm blessed beyond all measure. For he is mine. We don't realize. I do not know how many times during the course of the day that Judy and I 
I'll either say to her or she says to me, or then I say to her, we are so good. That sign's hanging all over our house. But you know, before it's on our house, it's in our hearts. We're so blessed. Church, you're so blessed. There's no place to get discouraged for all we see and what we must go through because we might go through some hard times. But let's keep our eyes looking up and ask God to deal and reconnect us to our first love. And the way I see it, we're already doing some of these other things God commended us. So if we can just say where God would get to the place where God would, if he had to write our letter right now, he wouldn't say the word never the less, I have somewhat against thee. Amen? Amen? We can do it all through Jesus. Heavenly Father, bless the word to our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Aaron, you can...